Uh, let's start then. Um, so my name is Mikhail Sokolov. Uh, I'm a software engineer in Evolution Gaming. I do backend development in Scala. So today I will present to you together with uh, um, with Artyom Mikulshov, who is also a backend developer, and uh, Yuris Kritis, uh, our um, Scala development manager. Is it correct? It's close enough. Okay. Yeah. So. Yeah. Uh, let me. Okay. So the topic today is. Uh, monitoring uh, Scala and Prometheus. So the we start with the with the presentation, which will be mostly about Prometheus, introduction to Prometheus from the viewpoint of a backend developer who works on services, on microservices, maybe on not so microservices, but things which are kind of part of a bigger uh, service-oriented architecture. And and then we will give you a sample code example in Scala. Uh, Artyom will guide you through the code. It kind of uh, it contains everything to to be able to uh, run Grafana, uh, Prometheus server, and uh, example application in Scala with all the functional goodies. Uh, so you can try it out on your own. Okay, so uh, monitoring. Um, to those who don't know what monitoring means in this in this context, so when we're running a complex system, uh, it's crucial to know how the system behaves. What is the state of the system? Is it in in a good shape or is it in a bad shape? Uh, what is the throughput of the system if that is our concern or what is the latency what is latency on different stages of uh, request processing and so on uh, and we would like to know that in in real time as well as in retrospection so we would like to be able to analyze uh, what happened in the past and it applies in scale starting from the components inside the single service instance to the service instances to uh, fleets of different services working in together to uh, solve uh, problems and serve customers. Yeah, so how do you do that? So it's not the only approach, but one of the approaches is we gather and analyze metrics which are uh, numerical uh, attributes of a system which would like to see and uh, analyze. So there are different monitoring tools. Uh, I put here some um, some names. Maybe some things are recognizable to you. So in this particular talk, we'll be talking about Prometheus. Uh, Do you see my pointer? Uh, yes, we do your pointer. It's now on Prometheus. And yeah, okay, sure. yeah, thanks. So we use Prometheus and and in evolution we use Grafana, but I wouldn't cover that. I won't cover that topic. So uh, you can read it on your own. Um, Prometheus. What is it? So it collects, stores, and uh, provides ways of processing the metrics. It has very uh, convenient query language for metrics, which is called PromQL or Prometheus query language. Um, yeah, quite inventive. Uh, it's scalable. Mm -hmm. And one peculiar thing about it is that it utilizes pool-based metric collection model 
which is different from push-based collection model. So, but we will talk that a bit later. Um, it has tools for alerting, and there is a built-in metric visualization tool. But um, we mostly use Grafana. I think Grafana is a lot more advanced. Uh, what are the components of Prometheus? Uh, so there is a Prometheus server. Uh, so this is the main thing. Uh, it has a built-in time series database for storing metrics and uh, querying them. And it's written in Go, in Golang. And it's, it's a single executable statically, statically built. So it's, it's quite convenient uh, for operations to use it. And I think it did become a sort of standard for such things. Yeah, next what there is uh, client libraries. Uh, there is a client library for Go, Java, Python, but mostly, so in evolution gaming, we use Java client library and different wrappers for it, for Scala. Uh, okay, so there is a, push gateway, it provides a way to collect metrics from short-lived processes. So there are issues with it, actually, with the Prometheus model. And there is alert manager. Uh, so it manages alerts and notifies people who needs to be notified when something is not right. Um, so the architecture of Prometheus. Uh, let's go through the things here. So there is a Prometheus server, and there are shipment service and order service are kind of our services, which we'd like to uh, get metrics from. And each service needs to expose a, an HTTP endpoint with a special format, which uh, every time you call it, it presents the values of uh, metrics at this particular moment in time. And uh, Prometheus servers has the list of all the uh, services which it needs to call, and the process of getting metrics from services called scraping. So it does scrape every uh, every 10 seconds, every 30 seconds. It's configurable, and uh, writes them down in his in its uh, time series database. Uh, the Exposition format in the endpoint is uh, human readable. Uh, you can expect it. Uh, you can call an endpoint with uh, like with a curl or just open a link from or, or your other browser and you can see what it's got. And uh, then the metrics you need to visualize them somehow. So you have Grafana in which uh, you write down the PromQL, PromQL queries, which are sent to Prometheus server, and then Prometheus server gives back the data for the requested time frames, and then the data is shown on on graphs and push gateway. So because we have a pool-based model, so the pool-based model is this that the Prometheus server calls the services to get metrics and not services are pushing metrics to the Prometheus server. We have issue with uh, short-lived uh, processes because, for instance, if the scrape happens every 30 seconds, but the uh, service lives only for 10, then it might never get uh, get its uh, metrics exported to Prometheus. So for this case, we have a push gateway, which has a separate API for pushing metrics in, from uh, short-lived processes, bad jobs, uh, etc., and then it exposes them in a uh, as a normal uh, HTTP endpoint for scraping. So let's talk about the data model. Uh, the data model on the Prometheus server is very simple. So Prometheus server operates on time series, and uh, what are the time series? Time series. Uh, each sample inside the time series, it consists of labels. It's a set of key value string pairs, and it's kind of an identifier of a time series. And 
uh, sample phase value. Values and parameters are 64-bit floating point numbers, always floating point. And millisecond precision timestamp. So the sample is labels, value, and the timestamp. And how does it look like in, in reality? So down below, uh, we have a representation of a metric of time series value in the HTTP endpoint of a service. This is how the data is represented. So uh, when you have a representation like this, what does it mean? Uh, the labels would be, uh, here you have a very special label. It's called underscore underscore name. Uh, uh, this is, uh, so basically the this representation with the underscore underscore name and this representation with the uh, prefix before the curly braces, it's equivalent. So uh, this this thing, which is before the curly braces is called usually, sometimes it's called a name of a metric, but in reality, it's just another label. And you can query it uh, this way and you can carry it this way. It's, it's no difference. Uh, and so there's a label name, label method, method, label endpoint, it has value, API tracks and label status has value 200. And value of a label is always a string. So we have like 200 uh, as a string and value will be 42 because there is a 42 there down below. And the timestamp, timestamp would be when the Prometheus scraped the, called the export API and get the values. And the client model is a bit different. So there is a mismatch between the, the things on which server operates and things which client knows. And those are translated to each other. Uh, so the, what client has, it has different, they are called metrics, types of metrics, counters, gauges, histograms, and summaries. Let's talk about counters. So uh, it's monotonically increasing value. Uh, so let's say that if we have an HTTP server, we can count number of requests served. Uh, the number will always increase because the total number of requests doesn't go down. Uh, another example would be, uh, let's say if we count the total time a JVM process spends in garbage collection. So if we spend like second now and one second later, total would be two seconds. And we also count the amount of data, for instance, we send somewhere, let's say to Kafka. Uh, so, and the only time the counter can sort of decreases when it resets to zero, when the service node restarts because the state of counter in the node is not persistent. So every time you restart an instance, it resets to zero. Uh, so what counters can be used for? Uh, the most useful, useful function for query function for counters is rate. Actually, it's like the, the main feature of Prometheus. I think like everything else will be, was built around it. Uh, so there is a, here's the PromQL expression. Uh, we, we get metric of uh, HTTP. Here we have a counter of HTTP requests. Gets with this endpoint, with this status. Uh, it's like a response status. And we want to calculate an average uh, rate over a five minute window. So here it is, here how it looks on in Grafana, for instance. Uh, and what the Prometheus does, it, it understands uh, where the metric were set due to node restart and it uh, accounts for that. Uh, yeah, that's how, that's how it works. Uh, an example. Uh, so usually Prometheus client libraries provide this kind of metric, uh, total time 
CPU time spent uh, by the process uh, is cumulative. So uh, let's say that if we if the process spends uh, CPU time share time slice, it's uh, it's added to this counter. So is it possible to deduct CPU usage from it? Uh, yeah, actually it's possible. Uh, so we can use rate. Uh, so we can just apply rate to the uh, CPU time spent by the process. Uh, uh, how does it work? Uh, so let's say your process does nothing. So it's uh, in one second your process uh, does nothing and it, and it spend it, uh, spent zero time slices. So it means that the count the counter didn't increase and your rate will be zero. Yeah. Then let's say uh, your process used uh, only half a second in one second, then the rate will be 0.5 or 50%. Yeah, all good. And if the process spent uh, was working for the, full, for the full second, then it spent one second CPU time in one second, it means that utilization was uh, 100%. And so you, in this example, you can see that in calculated this way, utilization can go above 100%. How could it be? It could be if you have more than one CPU core. So if you use two CPU cores uh, full time in one second, then uh, your CPU usage time will increase in, by two seconds. Uh, that means your rate will be 200, 200%. Uh, yeah, and actually that's that's how we usually measure it in, in production. Next, gauge. Gauge is just a numerical value. No special requirements. It can go up, down, anywhere. So it's just a point in time numerical value. What could be an example? So uh, for instance, memory usage of the process, the current memory usage or limit to the process if we use uh, C group limits, Docker limits. Um, number of active threads, which we're using right now. So those are all good candidates to use a gauge for them. Uh, example, so let's say we switched from, we use Java and we switch, it's on JVM. So we write in Scala, or everything we do is on JVM. We use JVM and we switch from uh, concurrent marking sweep garbage collector to G1 garbage collector and the heap usage patterns are very different with G1 and they're very erratic. So you can see there is, it, it's hard to see any trends in there. So with CMS, maybe sometimes it was possible to spot a memory leak, slow memory leak with your eye, but here it, it, it can be, it can be hard. So, but we have a metric for current, uh, heap usage in bytes. And what can we do with it to see if we have memory leaks? Well, sort of, we can uh, wonder the question. Uh, so there is a function called derive, derive, and it calculates a sp speed of change for the value using a simple linear regression. And here you can specify the time window over which the linear regression will be applied. So you can play with the different time windows and see uh, whether the, on average, uh, during the three hour window, you, your, your memory is always going. So the, the average speed of uh, heap change can show you the slow memory leak so here, what we can see, uh, I plotted this graph over 12 hours and looking by the average values, it looks like it doesn't have, doesn't have an issue. So if we have like five gigabytes of heap, uh, most likely we don't have to worry. Uh, 
next uh, histograms. S oh, okay, yeah, I skipped through. Okay, so histograms. Uh, histograms, they help us to see what the distribution is of a numerical value. Uh, and uh, what do we know to what do we need to know about the distribution of the value is usually averages uh, medians uh, quantiles percentiles those kind of things and in this case quantiles they are calculated on the primitive server side so this is how histogram down below you can see how the histogram uh, data export format looks like so one histogram it has several time series exported. So in this case, we're measuring the uh, request response time, sort of latency. And what do we export? So let's start with the, with the, with the part which is below, down below. So we export count. What does the count mean? Count means the number of samples, samples we encountered. So if we, if we had two requests coming in, we had two samples. Yeah, the next one, sum. Sum means the sum of all the values observed. So if we had like two requests coming in and we served both of them in five seconds, it means the sum will be 10 seconds. And as you can see, both time series count and sum, they sort of behave the same as counters. So you can apply to them the same, same functions as to counters. Next, what do we have? We have bucket values. Uh, so the way histogram is, uh, histogram time is calculated on the client. So the, uh, the space where the value can be is uh, split into several buckets. And uh, the client implementation, it uh, counts uh, where it has a, where where it uh, encounters a sample value, uh, it uh, increases the counter in uh, related buckets. Uh, so here, what does LE mean? Uh, LE means that this is the counter uh, for values which are less than or equal than uh, 0 0.05. So this is 50 milliseconds for values which are smaller than 50 less or equal than 50 milliseconds. Here we have 100 milliseconds, 200 milliseconds, 500 milliseconds, one second, and the upper bounds on here we have uh, a count of all the values. It should be the same as uh, samples count here. So uh, what can we do with the histogram? So there is one nifty function for which works on histogram in PromQL, it's called histogram quantile. Uh, so here in this example, what is this? We take a histogram of uh, HTTP request latency and we'll calculate a 99th percentile uh, over a 10 minute window. So yeah, that's how it looks like and how to calculate. So with this function, we can calculate 99 percentile, 98 percentile, in which one and like median, which is 0 0.5 percentile will be. Uh, average over a 10 minute window. So what do we do here? Uh, we apply rate to the sum of all values and we divide it by rate applied to the count of all values. Next type, summary. Uh, summary sort of uh, serves the same purpose. So we can see what is the distribution of the value, but the quantiles are calculated on the client side. Uh, so how does it look like in the export format? So here we have FPC request duration. Uh, down below, you can see the same two counters for count and sum as with histograms, but above 
uh, things are different. So here it exports the already calculated quantile values. So usually implementations, they have uh, slides in window, windows in, in them. So yeah, usually it's calculated over some configured slides in the window. Uh, and then the question, so histogram and summary, they're kind of the same thing. They serve the same purpose. So uh, when to use one and when to use another, why, why even bother with having two types of metrics for the same thing? But it turns out that they are kind of complementary to each other. They are a bit different. So histogram, uh, first it's lightweight for the client because it's just a number of uh, counters, uh, counter for sum counter for count of samples and then you have counters for each for each bucket you configured uh, and on jvm for instance those counters they implemented using double adders which are super lightweight uh, and histograms can be aggregated across different instances of application services and across any other label dimensions which you have so uh, if you report histogram, for instance, for each uh, method type, uh, you can aggregate them over method types. But the error, quantile calculation error is quite a tricky thing for histograms and I will talk about, a bit about it later. So it can be small and it can be very huge in, uh, in hundreds of percent, depending on the bucket boundaries you choose. And summary. So uh, summary would be like a, uh, like a evil twin to histogram. So it's heavy to calculate on the client uh, because the algorithm for quantile calculation uh, in the sliding window is way more involved than just uh, putting a plus one to a <laughs> to a counter. Uh, and usually, for instance, it involves uh, locks on shared state, uh, which is uh, way more heavy for for the usage than double adders. And summaries, they does not aggregate. And, uh, but the calculation error, the error margin is quite predictable. So let's talk about the error margins. Uh, let's assume we have a task of uh, keeping our 99th response time, 99th percentile response time under two and a half second. Uh, so which metric type should we use to monitor that? So we want to plot that on a graph and see how it goes and uh, how it changes in time and whether we're over the SLA or under the SLA. SLA threshold. So Summary, this is the example in Java, actually, uh, contrary to the title of, of this talk. Uh, okay, so this is how we create a summary in using Java client. And you can see that we configure the quantiles which would like to see to be, which would like to be calculated and exported. So here we have a median, with 5% uh, error, uh, 19, 19, 19, 90, oh, screw it. with 1% error, and 99th with 0.1%. So, yeah, you see that we configure up front the error margins which we would like to have. So, it's quite predictable. Uh, but at the same time, if you want an answer to the question whether you're at, at some moment in time, your response time is in the SLA bounds, the answer to this question will have the same error margin. So for instance, if you see the value on the graph, which is uh, two, is under 2.5 seconds, then, uh, or like 2.5 seconds, then you can be uh, higher the, the threshold or lower the threshold. Uh, during the, the error margin. 
how the histogram looks like in this regard. So this is how the histo histogram is created in Java, using Java client. So here we configure buckets. Uh, so what kind of buckets do we have? For 50 milliseconds, 100 milliseconds. Uh, no, it's, it's five milliseconds, 10 millisecond, uh, 25 milliseconds. So, and here we have one second and 2.5 seconds. And this is important. Uh, Histogram has histogram quantiles. They have very nice property that if you have a, a bucket boundary of uh, let's say 2.5 seconds, then if you see a calculated percentile value under the bucket value, then it, it is uh, it's a sure thing that the real uh, percentile value is under the 2.5 seconds as well. And uh, the opposite is true. So, if you see a calculated value over the uh, over the bucket boundary, so that means that the real percentile value is also over the bucket boundary. So it's we can be sure if we violate SLA or not. So for our use case, actually histograms uh, are a perfect fit. But uh, for instance, if your value calculated value is between the boundaries in let's say one second to 2.5 seconds, that what you can say about the real value is that it can be anything between the one second and 2.5 seconds. So the you can see the error margin could be quite huge. And uh, yes, Prometheus tries to do its best and it tries to e extrapolate uh, values between those boundaries, but uh, in in many cases it's it's just uh, wishful thinking so the only thing which i can be sure about is uh the relation of the real value with the boundaries but anything between the boundaries uh, you you cannot be sure about that but if the if, if the boundaries of the buckets are so important why just not to have a lot of buckets like Let's put buckets every five milliseconds, every 10 milliseconds, why not? Uh, but the thing is that buckets are limited resource and uh, the more buckets you have, the heavier the calculation on the server becomes. And uh, usually the documentation of Prometheus it recommends uh, 20, 30 buckets per metric. Uh, of course uh, you can have, so, you, you need to have like 20, 30 buckets per metric on average and like, but in some cases you can go over that if, you, if you're really sure what, you, what you're doing. And also what does that mean is that uh, for to use histograms in a meaningful way, it is important to have at least some idea upfront about the distribution of your value. So let's say if you lowest, if your lowest boundary is on uh, half a second, then you cannot say anything about values which are below half a second. And same goes for uh, the upper bounds. So if your upper bound, which is not infinite upper bound, uh, is on 10 seconds, then it's hard to tell anything for values which are higher than 10 seconds. You can tell for sure that you whether you have values over 10 seconds or you do not have values over 10 seconds, but the what are the, what is the distribution of uh, values which are hitting above 10 seconds? Uh, it's uh, it's a black box for you. So usually, if you want to measure request latency, then histograms are a good fit because uh, usually you know for sure what the you know up upfront really good what the what the distribution would be so for instance you know that like if you have a request latency under five milliseconds then you don't care just the same as zero for you and if you have a, and maybe you have a like request timeout of 10 seconds that means that your boundaries can be put somewhere between five milliseconds and 10 seconds and you can put them whether you whether you want them and but usually it's not a good fit for instance for uh, request size, uh, HTTP request size, especially if you have uh, 
if it, if it can vary a lot with like with data. So you can have requests of several hundred bytes, and you and then you can have requests of uh, megabytes, and you don't know upfront what is the max size request you can get. And let's a bit talk a bit about metric aggregation. Uh, so here's an example where you do use a function called sum, which is conveniently just sums all the values across uh, label dimensions. So here we have uh, count of HTTP requests for service named my service. Job is an internal uh, label in Prometheus, which kind of represents the service type from which the scrapes are coming. And we do rate five minutes average on it. And then we sum across all the instances of the service. Uh, another example. So here we have aggregate function called max and, and also you can deduct what it does by its name is it finds the maximum value across label dimensions so in this case uh, we have a max heap size it's sort of xmx uh, gvm parameter uh, and we trying to find the maximum of upper bounds of heap sizes reported for each service. So we do max by label name job. Yeah, and here is another example where, here is example of uh, aggregation of uh, histograms and quantiles for histograms. So what do we do? We calculate, we have a response latency and we want to see a median response latency reported for each request type. So we have a label called request type. And what do we do? Uh, we, so here we have histogram quantile 0 0.5, it's median. But then inside, uh, we need to do a sum of rates of buckets. And we need to report that sum by request type and by LE. So the metric which goes inside histogram quantile function, it should have LE label uh, in order for Prometheus to calculate quantiles. So here you have a graphand representation for this. So those are request type label values, and here are the, the numbers. Uh, and let's return to questions of uh, aggregating uh, summaries. Why we can't aggregate summaries? So histogram, what is it? It's just a bunch of counters, uh, nothing else. And uh, counters can be aggregated. So you can do rate on them, you can sum them, you can do anything with those, with those values. And for summaries, we have already calculated quantiles, percentiles, and uh, there is no sure, uh, there is no way to correctly do it in every case. And this is my last slide actually. So uh, what I would suggest to read. So the Prometheus, it has terrific documentation, especially for uh, client kind of usage for service developers and the first thing which I would like to recommend is uh, metric and label naming convention so they have quite they have interesting uh, standards for this so you need to be aware of those and the Prometheus query language documentation is also quite good uh, they have several pages for different parts of the language and uh, with uh, useful examples uh, and I think that's it for the for the first part. Uh, let's do some questions. Um, 
Any questions? Uh, we have a question in chat. In chat? Marco. Uh, so, okay. I I'll ask it like that as well. Uh, do you count full gateway as a part of your application or it's kind of more a uh, part of evolution infrastructure? A push gateway? Yes. Um, yeah, to be honest, I never used it. So uh, I know in idea how it should work, but uh, I, I've never encountered it myself. So I recall that it's a separate deployable service. Is it correct? Probably, I feel like you know better about me, better about this thing than me. Yeah, I saw it just uh, re regular, same as uh, some exporters that you can get. But um, for me, it's not clear where is the border. So which parts should be deployed for all evolution and which parts should be deployed for every application. That's the first thing. So. Uh, well, so as yes, far as I know, currently Prometheus service, they're sure they're shared. Uh, shared infrastructure and alert managers and uh, uh, I think that's that's all for shared infrastructure. I don't think we use uh, push gateways anywhere at least I'm, I, I'm not aware about such a thing. Uh, one more question. Uh, do you config uh, this IP address or the Prometheus goes and gets the data for every microservice manually, or you have some config that gets uploaded to this uh, Prometheus stuff? And it uh, so is it is it a question about discovery? How do Prometheus yes. discover yes. the? Yes, partial. Yes. Uh, well, yeah. To be honest, I don't do infrastructure, but in my understanding, uh, current way of doing things, it's it should. In theory, if everything configures properly, it should happen automatically. So, for instance, for all the services which are deployed in our internal Kubernetes, uh, everything is done automatically. So, I think there are, I know that there are integrations for Prometheus into service disc different, like server discovery systems. So, Prometheus has ways to find about services and new instances uh, yeah but if you do it yourself like on local scale then sure you can just add statically ip addresses and uh, http uh, endpoint addresses into configuration files and redeploy Prometheus. and uh, do you have some uh, tests for this uh, prometheus matrix uh, I don't think we test it. So uh, it's it possible to test them, uh, but metrics, they're such things that usually you don't make any business important decisions based on them. So, um, so they're kind of considered as a second, uh, second priority. Uh, to so if you so you, you cannot write tests for everything which you have in your project so it's in most cases it's not feasible you need to prioritize which you write tests first and uh, which you write tests later if you if, if you write them at all so the metrics are usually considered second tier citizen in this regard okay great thanks Please don't be shy. You can ask questions about the presentation or about anything. Anything you fancy. Uh, 
Um, what is the most complicated Prometheus query that you have had to write? What was it about in your work? Um, so I think starting from Prometheus 2, uh, the query language has uh, a feature. So you can write nested queries. And once you have it, uh, you can be very creative. <laughs> with your queries and they can grow um, almost so there are kind of no no bounds to this this process and I, I think the the biggest one I wrote it was maybe f five lines and it was like two or three nested levels of uh, nested queries but it feels a bit like if you do nested uh, queries in SQL so if you ever did something like this, you you get the idea how how it looks like. Yeah. But for what instance, problem was it solving? Like five levels of nested, but uh, uh, yeah. So let me let me recall it. Um, so. I think I had something like um, a data stream, uh, continuously run, running data stream, uh, which were taking events from one place and putting them into another. And uh, I wanted to measure the, to have, any, to have an idea about the latency uh, of the stream. So how much time does it take to get for a rent to get from place A to place B? And uh, I had a metric uh, for each event reported. So for each event, we reported uh, the time, how much time would did for for an event to get uh, to the destination. And then I wanted sort of a single value representing the the worst case sort of worst case latency, so I can put it on the dashboard and make a big uh make it big at look at it every day i don't know like <laughs> so what did i do uh we had several substreams in this stream so each instance of the service had several substreams and we had those those values reported for each substream and uh, what did i do i calculated the average latency over a window for a substream. And then I did over that a max uh, over all substream instances across all the services. And that's how I get, that's how I got a, a single nice looking number, which sort of represented the Max max latency. Okay, thank you. Uh, we, we have one more open question actually in the chat. Yeah, yeah, we have a question from Abdul. Well, I, I have an issue with the chat, so somehow I don't see it. Uh, it's in Q and A, it. but I I will read it. What is your opinion on using I rate instead of rate to make spikes more visible on the charts? All your examples were only about the rate function. Oh, okay, so there are many functions in PromQL and uh, uh, I didn't cover like 99-90% of those in this talk. And iRate is one of those functions which can be applied to counters and uh, it's different from rate in the sense that rate uh, calculates average of a time window and iRate tries to calculate instantaneous change so it tries to find it, it takes two closest uh, scrape values and just calculates the difference between them and divides it by time uh, past so if you have a fast changing value then I rate actually might show different picture from a rate because rate could be uh, a bit a lot more smooth than I rate. So if you have like a uh, 
fast peaks, then on rates those can be hidden, uh, sort of you wouldn't see them, you wouldn't see them. And yes, sure you can use fast changing values, but the mm, there is a catch that uh, you can use that, but if you use uh, Prometheus with Grafana, um, Grafana does its own sort of uh, sampling of values, and uh, depending on the time time frame you choose, uh, these samples can be uh, done in a way that your fast change in value will just be lost. So you would see value before the fast change and after the fast change, but not in the middle. So uh, I rate it usually is useful mostly when you do uh, close metrics inspection. So for instance, you like, you know that in this particular hour something happened and you look in this particular hour and then I rate uh, can show you, can show you what what was the behavior but if you look at the big picture like how the system behaved over let's say a month then your uh, grafana sampling step can be something like 30 minutes one hour and uh, you might just you might just not see the uh, the spikes there yeah so the question answer is yeah you can use i rate if you know what you're doing, but rate is more uh, is more foolproof, I would say like this. I actually enabled the audio privileges of, of like everyone. Um, so if you want to ask a question, you can also just unmute yourselves and ask. Okay, um, if it seems like there's no more questions or did I miss any in chat? Were there any questions in chat? So Mikhail, how did you want to continue this? Uh, did you want to talk briefly about the sample application that we uh, have? Yeah, I thought uh, the, uh, Artyom, let's yeah, talk I'll Scala. It. Yeah, but <laughs> please stop, stop, stop uh, screen sharing. I need to share uh, my one, screen. One sec. Oh, I was trying to improvise. I thought for some reason I was looking in participants and not in panelists and I didn't see Artyom and I started to improvise a bit. So I will uh, I'll post a few links for you guys. Like uh, one is uh, read me how to uh, set it up. And second is repo that you have to clone. Well, uh, basically, to try it out all the things that uh, were described by Mikhail and uh, so this we prepared small sample application plus small gu small guide how to run Prometheus uh, stack locally and um, let me share my screen I'll I'll just uh, I'm gonna describe uh, checkpoints that you're gonna go through and uh, and Check if you are doing this right. And just for some context, it was actually prepared before the pandemic with the assumption that the attendees will be live and then we can kind of walk over to whoever has any troubles going through all the steps and help in a live fashion. And now this is, uh, we've kind of adjusted the expectations because sometimes like people, I think on uh, uh, Windows or Linux are getting a bit stuck on the various uh, steps. Okay, I'm I'm really sorry, but I have to restart my Zoom because it's need it it, it requests it requires uh, permission to share my screen. So please uh, wait wait a minute. Stay tuned.
I think we lost our term from the list of panelists. Can someone add him? Yuris? Yes, absolutely. I was doing that instead of unmuting myself. Uh, Artem should not be <laughs> again. Yeah, I'm here. Thanks. Sorry for this. Do you see my screen? Do you see idea? Yeah. Yeah. So we have a small application that uh, exposes um, metrics and uh, it exposes some default GVM metrics, default uh, HTTP4S metrics, and there is one more added manually. It's a request counter. Basically, it just counts all the incoming requests. And uh, after launching the application, it can be a, from IDEA or whatever, from SBT. You have to be able to see your local host slash metrics returns you something like this. And if you, for example, check the requests, requests metric, here it is. It shows a zero, for example, and uh, we can load some, our application with some uh, requests. For example, let's do 50 requests. <clears throat> something is yeah something is happening here so yeah it shows you this request is updating so you just calculate it calculates total amount of requests that were handled so uh, this is this is your kind of your first step like the make this application up and running and uh, then you go and uh, read uh, this readme file that i send you and after configuring the parameters basically uh, adding uh, this after configuring this parameters yaml file please be careful with yaml file it's kind of very sensitive format so uh, and after restarting uh, the Parameters. Um, you have to check your Prometheus targets, and you have to be able to see this line that is up and running. That meaning that Prometheus is kind of scrapping your metrics from your application, and then after this, you can try to import the GVM. GVM metrics that, that, that is provided in the wrapper as well. Uh, so basically you do import like this and you specify the file. Basically you have you will you will see something like this, all the GVM metrics that were exposed by the by the application. So oops, sorry. And yeah, just to play around with some other metrics that were by HTTP4S, for example, you can also play around with uh, for example, request count and uh, try to do, for example, rate on request, total on request. So basically, this is how it, this is how it should look, and uh, this is the just initial setup. Uh, like, do whatever you want with it. Uh, experiment, do experiments. Uh, I guess this that's it from my side. There is not much to say actually. So just go carefully to readme file, and. Um, there can be differences and I'm not sure about uh, running it on Windows actually, but uh, uh, if you're on Linux, yeah, or on Mac, it should work perfectly. Um, 
so first of all, maybe somebody has questions about the example application that Artem's uh, talked about. And second, yes. before I forget, I posted the link to the feedback form. So after the meetup, please fill out the feedback form, which is in the chat. But uh, who has any questions on Artem? Artem's material? Artem, can you uh, demo us adding uh, some uh, uh, new metric and how it changes in your uh, sample application to show how it is easy to add metrics? Yeah, let me share the screen. So, uh, for example, what we can do, uh, maybe I need some help from you guys. Uh, so we need to add new panel, I guess. So, and uh, you remember we were discovering this request, total count, yeah? So what we can do with this, can we, job is, it's actually main monitoring, right? So when it shows you like the kind of distribution of the value, or not distribution, like the, something like this it's just a value yeah just a value. yeah it actually shows me that i try uh, applying rate function like this. looks like it, it has a artificial that's built in wow nice <laughs> it doesn't allow me to type actually right oh wow it's really For those maybe who missed this part, so this is Grafana, the visualization tool we use. Should I should I specify like time frame for it? Or? Yeah. yeah, time window. So five minutes maybe it's fifty. How to interpret it, Michael? <laughs> well, <laughs> well, could you point could you point go, eight? Okay, okay. Could you go to place where it specifies the um, um, value type sort of, so it should be like an operation per second, I guess, like re request per second. Where it is? Uh, on the, on your right, somewhere down, down, down. It just has new UI, I'm not really familiar with this latest tool. Yeah, yeah, we use the, the previous one. Yeah, it's unit, you need to change the unit here. And and left left y so because you can no. you can put two two graphs on the same same board. What it should be like. uh, uh, throughput. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, that well, no, not megabytes. Uh, no, 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 no. It, it should it should be called throughput. Nice. <sighs> Yeah, it's, 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 I'm also not familiar with the new Grafana interface, actually, it's. Oh, teraflops, cool. <laughs> yeah, you see, you can specify different. Uh, oh yeah, data rate. Maybe that, did we try that? What is? Ah, okay, screw it. Yeah, so, <laughs> so here we have, maybe you can add a, uh, um, a legend. But it's there. No. Show table to the right. Yeah, but it's. Uh, yeah, well, let's do it like this. Here. Okay, so and you can then add max. Probably this is the the interesting one. Yeah, the the values in in the values panel on the on the right on your right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I see. Here is Max. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we we can see that on Max we had an average rate uh, of uh, zero point eight requests per second. Uh, oh, <laughs> I guess this is the the best we can interpret it. 
Yeah, but basically you have to change the uh, unit, yeah. So. Yeah, it should have like throughput to unit somewhere. It should be like operation per second, request per second, it's something like this. Uh, yeah. Maybe let's calculate the GC time spent. That sounds a great idea. Yeah. Let's do it. Ah, we, yeah, we can add new map to for that. Oh, sorry. Nope, nope. Not there. So, so what do we have here? GC. No, no, it's and, G, G, not J. GC, yeah, sorry. GM collection. Seconds sum. Probably this is the this is the part. So you see there are different uh, types of GCs reported as label values. So we have like we have a G1 garbage collector and the young generation collection. But when we have uh, old generation collection, we'll have different values there. Yep. So let's uh, so we can calculate the rate out of it. Let's do like, I don't know. What's what's your scrape interval actually here? Uh, good question. <laughs> well, uh, usually, I guess it's like need 10 to check seconds. This, I guess, YAML for, huh? 10 seconds? It's seconds, I guess, because it's the default. No, okay. no, no. What, so, what were, what were uh, this? Uh, usually the, you want your rate windows to be a lot bigger than the scrape interval to have meaningful values calculated. So uh, typically you use like five minutes, 10 minutes, two minutes is fine still. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, so can and you put some load? Yeah, that. And uh, let's add uh, legend values. Uh, so what what will be interesting then? Current total. Yeah, let's value. and let's make it this. Nothing happens actually. Yeah, but do do we have a lot? Let's sure. let's check let's check request metrics. <laughs> request no request no we have. Uh, yeah we have. Here. Can we can we add more requests? I think part of the problem is that the application actually doesn't do a whole lot. It just. <laughs> Doesn't yeah, it basically does nothing. So it just replies you after some random thread sleep. Yeah, I, I had an idea actually. So could you go to your requests uh, requests handler? Maybe let's add I'm some sure. uh, g garbage generating activity there. Whoa, whoa. that was great. Uh, so can, I, can, you, I can you be sure that we like uh, uh, force it somehow or what? E so we can allocate uh, arrays. What? Yeah, let's just allocate arrays and I don't know. Print uh, identity hash code or something. Just like. System uh, identity. Yep. And here you should have new array. Uh, new array of uh, bytes. And how many bytes do you want? It. Well, let's let's have sixteen thousand. 
So I think identity hash code. Uh, so in some cases, I know that the GVM can abstract away the values which are unused. And so we need to use to, to make okay. the use of the values Bye. somehow. Will it print something? Yeah, so let's see. Yeah, what? yeah, so we have some GC activity. We can actually see that. Uh, so what is the unit actually here? So we have to hear a rate of second in second. So it's something like uh, ratio or percentage. So let's let's put percentage here. Unit, uh, oh boy, no, 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 misc, yeah, a percent, and here we have percent between zero and one. Yeah, so because we the value which we'll calculate will be like so, it's an uh, it's like ratio, not like a percentage. So we, we can plot it as a percent here, so it will. Uh, multiply by 100 when it plots. Yeah, so we see that we can say that at max we're spending less than 0 0.01, 0 0.02 actually percentage of CPU time on GC. Uh, let's go a bit further. So uh, we plot here only, uh, so we here report. Um, the time spent, the time usage uh, for each uh, GC type individually. So let's sum it, make a sum. You mean separate uh, bar graph? Yeah, it could be separate. Let, let's do it in separate. No, it should be sum of rate okay, because yeah. you you need to first do rate and then you can do sum, not the vice versa. That's the rule. Yeah, so this is the total C, the total GC uh, time usage, CPU time usage for GC. Kind of the same. Yeah, we don't have uh, all generation <laughs> collections. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thanks. I guess it's about time. So maybe you guys have questions. Maybe we can talk a little bit more about the Scala code which we have here. Well, it's not real rocket science, except that we have it uh, wrapped in a YOM on it. Yeah, so this is a like modern functional Scala code. Uh, so you can uh, feel free to take uh, maybe simplified version of returning some metrics and point. If you need. I'll stop screen sharing for a while. Okay, any other um, questions on anything? You can also ask questions in voice if you prefer that way. I unmuting. Ask me anything. All right, well, if there are no uh, questions, then please I encourage you to fill out the Google form, um, which I posted in the chat. And thank you very much, Mikhail. Thank you, Artyom, for the excellent presentation.
Thank you, Yuris. Thanks, everybody, for joining. I hope it was uh, kind of informative for you guys and have fun with the example project. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Uh, have an excellent evening. Oh, and by the way, uh, we will be renewing, probably, if there's interest, we will be renewing the Scala kind of workshops, intro to Scala workshops we were doing. We had our Evolution Gaming Hackathon uh, last um, week, so we skipped this one, and we had this lecture there. By the way, we are actually planning to announce a Scala kind of like a boot camp um, in Riga. Well, it will be taking online and probably at least. Um, but we'll see by the time we actually get there, we'll first collect applications and so forth. It's going to be third and fourth quarters uh, this year was the goal of, uh, of finishing uh, this uh, year. We actually had a very good uh, Scala bootcamp uh, organized by our Minsk colleagues uh, in Minsk, and which took place um, late last year and early this year. It basically just ended, and the results were, were so good. We kind of uh, saw a lot of enthusiasm, a lot of really, really uh, good new Scala developers, people who had the little Scala experience becoming great Scala developers that we thought that uh, we will uh, do the same thing here in Riga as well. So, so that's kind of the plan. Stay tuned for announcements. We will definitely also announce it in a uh, group. If you know anyone who would actually be interested in learning Scala uh, and attending a bootcamp, then uh, you can uh, already tell them to watch, watch this space for announcements. I mean, the, actually, the workshops which we were doing initially uh, were from the Minsk Bootcamp, but it's really like just the first, uh, first lecture that we, um, that we did uh, spread along multiple lectures in a somewhat slower format. Any questions on that or anything else? If not, then thank you again for attending. Have an excellent evening. Thank you, Mikhail. Thank you, Artyom. Thank you all. Bye.